I am skeptical of just the mere ability to, to get conscious insight into what's going on with you, that that itself, I mean, I think that has real limits on how therapeutic it can be, what real limits on what a difference it can make. I mean, very neurotic, stuck people can have a lot of insight into what's going on with them, and it doesn't help them get out. So I think that there's, and I think this is a really, really important um, issue that I think psychoanalytic technique has to be understood or has to be something that has a kind of real efficacy in that achievement of this understanding is itself efficacious in changing the very thing it understands. Hello, this is Robinson Earhart here with the introduction to Robinson's podcast number 149. And this episode is with Jonathan Lear, who is the John Uneff Distinguished Service Professor in the Department of Philosophy and at the Committee on Social Thought at the University of Chicago. Jonathan is also, also a practicing psychoanalyst, and his work focuses on understanding the human psyche, both through philosophy, with an emphasis, as you'll hear, on Aristotle and the ancients, and psychoanalysis. And in this episode, Jonathan and I discuss three pinnacles of psychoanalysis, which you'll have heard come up on the show before, though probably not in as much depth. And these are the fundamental rule, aka free association, or uh, they're not the same thing, but for the intents and purposes of my introduction, I think they're the same. And then the unconscious and then transference, all of which we define and we get into, we get deep into them over the course of our conversation. So I learned a lot from talking with Jonathan and reading his essays, but one of the most important takeaways for me applies to all psychodynamic psychotherapy, I think. And it's that one of the goals of treatment is freeing up new ways of thinking. So we all have deeply ingrained patterns of behavior that have led us to become stuck in various ways. And again, you'll hear much more about this. But one purpose of these therapeutic practices is to identify these patterns or help us identify these patterns and then develop the freedom to move around them. Jonathan's most recent book is Wisdom, One from Illness, Essays in Philosophy and Psychoanalysis, and the link to this book is in the description. I also, as you will know, like to mention that reviews, comments, likes, subscribes, follows, they're extraordinarily important. And now, without any further ado, I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I enjoyed having it with Jonathan. I've spoken with a number of philosophers and psychoanalysts on the show, but you're the first who is both an active analyst and an active philosopher. And this raises the question, did one come first for you and somehow lead to the other, or did your interests arise independently and they just happened to merge? Yeah, I, I I don't fully know the answer to that question. I think there probably isn't an answer. I you know I for a long time I thought philosophy came first, and uh, and then I got interested in psychoanalysis as I was doing my philosophical work. But then later, years later, I was unpacking a back a box of books in the basement, and I saw that I was reading Freud in high school, and I'd forgotten all about it. But there was my name, and uh, so I don't know. I mean, I think the um, in some sense, I think. You know, I, I do think infants are very philosophically minded creatures. And I also, if, if Freud is right, we're also very psychoanalytically minded creatures. So I don't think there's a there's a beginning um, for me, or at least I don't know what it is. But, you know, in terms of like, I don't know, more conscious, self-conscious awareness and stories, I've been training in philosophy for a while. I had begun teaching. I was, a, you know, uh, first I was a student at Cambridge and then was teaching at Cambridge. And um, 
it was during that period of uh, teaching philosophy, in particular, I was teaching Aristotle, teaching some philosophical logic, that I just became more and more interested in um, psychoanalytic theory and psychoanalysis in general. Part of that was I had friends around me and colleagues who were interested. Uh, Bernard Williams, who was a teacher and then a colleague of mine, was actually very interested in psychoanalysis. He didn't write about it particularly. There are a few mentions of Freud, but he was very interested in psychoanalysis. And we both had a mutual friend, Richard Volheim, who was a you know very distinguished philosopher, who was at that time the chair of University College London. And Richard uh, wrote a lot about psychoanalysis. He himself was um, psychoanalyzed and was very, very knowledgeable. And the three of us uh, talked a lot about psychoanalytic work. And so, I mean, in terms of like the official story, I suppose, is that it was during my time uh, just beginning teaching at Cambridge that I became, I started reading and thinking about it. It's funny, you, you mentioned that you discovered you had been reading Freud in high school. I have only become interest in, interested in psychoanalysis in the past four or five years, but tomorrow I'm having a, a conversation on the show about The Denial of Death, which is a book that I read maybe 10 or 12 years ago and had entirely forgotten that it was entirely about uh, Freud, Rank, Kierkegaard, psychoanalysis. So that that's funny. But I guess... More specifically then, so you were teaching Aristotle at Cambridge, and was it then that you did your training at a psychoanalytic institute, or was it more of an apprenticeship model? It, 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 I... Uh... <clears throat> I mean, I'll just say in teaching Aristotle, I was, I mean, I've, you know, I've had a, as it turns out, a lifelong love affair, adult love affair with Aristotle. And one of the things that he, you know, I, I was found very impressive about him is not simply the, you know, beauty of his arguing and thoughtfulness, but that he really wanted to um, look at the details of nature as he found them. I mean, he was a great observer of life in all of its forms. And I, I, I felt part of my um, part of my inclination was just I didn't want to just write about Aristotle, although I did want to do that. But I in some sense I wanted to be more like him. <laughs> and uh, I thought, you know, what part of nature if I were going to look at nature carefully, I didn't feel like doing, um, you know, empirical science. But um, was there some kind of observing that might be um, appropriate to me? And I thought, if, you know, at the end of this was uh, the end of the 20th century, I thought uh, what really interests me the most are human beings. And um, so I became interested in psychoanalysis. I felt for kind of, I don't know, some kind of Aristotelian motivation or spirit that I wanted to instantiate. At that point, I was just reading uh, in Cambridge, but then there was this moment of transition where I decided to return to the United States and I took up a job at Yale. And I had been living abroad for quite a while, and I thought re-entering American culture might be difficult for me after spending so long abroad. And I thought to my, I was thinking to myself, well, you know, what could I do in America that I would like to do that I couldn't do in England? And that might make it easier for me to make this transition. And I had heard through the grapevine that um, in New Haven, there was an excellent psychoanalytic institute, the Western New England uh, Psychoanalytic Institute. And so from, from England, from Cambridge, I wrote to the, um, to the Western New England Institute and asked if I could, um, you know, apply as a first year candidate. And uh, they accepted me. So I went back to America, you know, as firstly as a you know, professor at Yale, but as a first year candidate at, um, at, at at the Western New England Institute. And that began my serious clinical training and analytic training. It really began when I returned to the United States. Hmm. This lifelong uh, love affair with Aristotle is very present and evident in your recent writings at the intersection of philosophy and psychoanalysis. But a, a few minutes ago, you said that Aristotle is a, a great observer or was a great observer of life in all its forms. And this, of course, parallels psychoanalysis and that psychoanalysis is meant, I think, or at least contemporary psychoanalysis, as I understand it, is meant to 
foster a very basic and deep awareness of the self. And I imagine that as a practicing psychoanalyst, you're concerned with observing others' selves as they unfold. But in being and having been psychoanalyzed yourself, you're trained to observe your own mind as it unfolds. Well, well, that's true. I mean, I, I think if Aristotle were alive now, he'd be interested in psychoanalysis. I mean, he'd be interested in a lot of other things, too. But, um, you know, even, you know, in his time, firstly, a major concern about when he was writing about our human being was the fact that we have um, different parts of the soul. And he uses an expression of the, the parts of the sp soul speak with um, different voices, uh, and, and he he does use that language, which I take very seriously. And, you know, it's a, it's a very serious, it's the heart of, I think, his approach to ethics, human, you know, human well-being, that um, the various parts of our soul need to learn how to speak, as he put it, speak with the same voice or speak together, speak in community with each other. Um, and so I think, you know, I think of psychoanalysis as a... Um, you know, a relatively contemporary attempt to take seriously um, the idea that there, the different parts of the soul have different voices and they do speak out, and uh, and that part of human flourishing is rests on the capacity to integrate those parts of the soul, which does have something very important to do with um, uh, listening to the different voices and helping them to learn how to speak to each other. Now, of course, you know, we we live in a, a, our world is different from Aristotle's. I don't want to, you know, claim that it's the same. I think we have a much more, um, you know, a, a focused view on um, the first personal subject and the importance of um, the first person um, in living a successful life. I mean, there are lots of important differences too. But um, I think that there's uh, that, that issue of the souls speak with voices and how do you get to b enter conversation uh, is, is, is an enduring question. Hmm. Yeah. And these, these different voices of the soul is where I'd like to begin, though. I don't think that as long as we're talking about psychoanalysis, we can escape this idea. And that being said, uh, psychoanalysis, though it's, endlessly caricatured is a very deep, very deep system of knowledge and practices. And I'm hoping to spend our time today talking about some of its central tenets. And I think the proper place to start, and this is borne out by the name I'm about to invoke, is the fundamental rule of psychoanalysis. So first, just quite broadly, I mean, what is the rule and what is its origin? Well, the the rule is quite simple. Uh, I mean, it takes a little while to get the the, the gist of it, but um, the basic, the, the fundamental rule is simply a rule that you know, the analyzans, the people who are in analysis, are asked at the beginning of an analysis <clears throat> to say whatever it is that comes into their mind without any inhibition or holding back or distortion. Um, so that's it. It's very simple. Just in some important sense, it's simply the rule to please speak your mind out loud. Now, that um, it's, it's quite astonishing what then happens. I mean, but, but really the analytic situation is I think organized and constituted around this rule. That is why Freud came to call it the fundamental rule. Uh, you know, there's the definite article, the, and <laughs> then there's the word fundamental. That's pretty important. Um, I mean, I think I'll just say, I mean, there's a lot to be said about w what else goes on in analysis. I don't want to overdo it, but it is worth getting clear on uh, why this is so important. Uh, it began with Freud just asking his patients to say what was on their mind and then got more and more formulated as a rule. But when you think about it, uh, really, I think what Freud hit upon was a, um, a kind of different meaning of what it is for us to speak our minds. Because, you know, the familiar sense of like, you know, speaking your mind 
is to say what you believe, to say it out loud, say what you believe. And, um, and that brings you in to the realm of, you know, what Socrates and Plato and Aristotle called logos. Uh, when they said they were, we're rational animals, we are animals who can state our beliefs out loud and then we can be questioned about them by others. And why do you believe that? And you give reasons back. And if you're truthful and open about what you say, um, and if you're given the freedom of being in a social environment where you're not, you know, horribly punished for saying what you believe and think, that's, you know, the familiar meaning of speaking your mind. But the fundamental rule is very different because it, I mean, for me, I've, I've used this analogy of the relationship of the Sabbath to the rest of the week, because the fundamental rule says, you know, don't worry about logos right now. I mean, if something comes into your mind that makes no sense to you, or it's embarrassing, or actually gets in the way of the point you're making, I mean, normally we just, you know, we're trained, especially philosophers, we're just trained to uh, just push things out of our minds if they don't fit the argument we're making or the point we're making or, you know, what we want to say to other people. And the fundamental rule says, take a rest from that. <laughs> Can you spend 50 minutes of a day not doing that. Uh, and, and, um, and the other thing that's so interesting, I think the analogy of the Sabbath, I mean, we think of the Sabbath as a day of rest, but actually the Sabbath is a day in which you are commanded to rest. Uh, you know, it's one of the commandments, uh, you know, honor the Sabbath and, and make it holy. And the fundamental rule is a rule in the sense that you are being asked not to go along with the normal daily constraints of uh, logos, of arguing and stating your beliefs and stating why you think things, and just say whatever happens to come into your mind, um, you know, while you're while you're in this analytic hour. Now, it's a fascinating and empirical discovery that basically nobody can do this. <laughs> um, I mean, I don't think, you know, anybody really knew till you started out that um, people can't do it. Uh, I mean, there are people who can just, you know, there are people who are in various psychological states where they just say out loud whatever isn't coming into their mind. But that isn't following the fundamental rule because you have to be not just doing it, but following the rule to do it. And it turns out when people are capable of following the rule, they don't. <laughs> and uh, that's an, a very fascinating fact about us as cr human creatures. And really, the psychoanalytic work gets started in this very spot where, although I'm meant to be just speaking my mind, somehow I don't do it. And um, and this is where the work with you know analyst and analyst and working together really get started. Hmm. Well, we will get, because I'm very interested in talking about the purpose and the utility of the fundamental rule. But first, is the fundamental rule what's more commonly referred to as free association? Are they interchangeable? Well, pretty closely. They're, I wouldn't say they're exactly interchangeable. But yes, what you are being asked to do is free associate. That's what free association is, just saying out loud, um, you know, whatever it is that comes into your mind. So yes, they're almost identical. The only difference is the one I was trying to allude to, which is in analysis, um, the fundamental rule is asking you to do that. Um, it's asking you to free associate, as opposed to just free associating that that's what the structure is so there's something someone you know someone in some psychological state may just be saying out loud whatever it is that comes into their mind um it's usually not a very happy place to be but within analysis people are trying to do that because they've been asked to do it i mean that is the constant you know a constituting um setup of the analytic situation itself. Well, psychoanalysis is over a hundred years old. It's, it's not practiced. Well, various contemporary psychoanalysis, psychoanalysts 
practice psychoanalysis very differently. There have been very different there have been theorists with very different theories about psychoanalysis. And that's not really what I want to get into right now. But I've spoken with Slavoj Žižek a couple of times on the show, and I don't think he's so much a Freudian as a Lacanian. And they may have very different views on the fundamental rule. But something he said that I found very striking was that free association is exactly the opposite of what the name suggests in that when one is following the fundamental rule, they're ideally at the whims of their unconscious. And ideally, then their conscious self is inhibited from exhibiting freedom by determining what comes from their mouth. So it's almost the antithesis of freedom, since it's just whatever comes out, comes out. Yeah. Well, you know, let me just say a couple things. I mean, just in, in response, going from the beginning to the end of your, your comment. But the first thing, I, I just want to make clear about what I think I'm doing. Uh, you know, one of the things I think I'm doing, I'm not trying, I'm not at all trying to say, you know, the thing I am explaining is psychoanalysis is the only thing there could possibly be. And anybody who has a different view is making a mistake. And you ought to, uh, you know, you ought to agree with me. I, I'm not saying that at all. I um, you know, I think that there are a lot of fruitful and um, differing uh, approaches to psychoanalysis. What I do take myself to be doing is laying down a real paradigm. And I think it's a very important paradigm and inviting people to take a look at this and think about it. Um, so I think it commands attention and respect. And I'm, that's what I'm trying to explain why why that might be. Now, um, Zizek, I mean, I, he, um, uh, you know, he, and I, you know, I think of, of him as enjoying, uh, life <laughs> and, uh, you know, part of the way he enjoys life is to come up with kind of paradoxical, uh, claims and sayings and, uh, and people enjoy that too. And I think that's fine. I mean, you know, people, uh, that's a that, that can be very enjoyable, and so there's. It's not like there's nothing right about what he's saying. I think it, you know, it, there there's some sense in which um, there what he's saying is is correct. But I mean, I think I feel that the formulation of it is spoken for the enjoyment of uh, of it sounding like the opposite of what you would think. I actually think he, you know he would he would agree with me, and uh, we would have fun discussing this issue. But. Uh, you know, um, I do think that important issues, uh, you know, the, like the, the word freedom, as, as Aristotle would say about many important terms, uh, can be said in a variety of ways. Or let's, you know, for an English speaking world, uh, you know, in Wittgenstein would say there's, you know, there's a family resemblance. There, there isn't one thing that freedom means or having freedom or not having it. I mean, these are, there, there are a family of meanings these terms might have. Now, you know, I think one of the things Socrates thought, and you see this in the Republic is, I mean, he doesn't put this, uh, you know, p particularly in terms of freedom, but I think it's a Socratic idea, which is that, you know, we, the, the subjects of freedom or unfreedom are really ourselves. I mean, you know, the individual person and how, how wh whether their minds are working freely or whether they can speak or, um, think or act freely um, is really the locus is going to be the the person, and you know freedom of the person is going to be inhibited if there is a you know you might say strong dramatic unconscious set of forces that are um, at work in one's life uh, one doesn't know about them. Uh, you know, that and has no real control over them. They're sort of, you know, as Freud said about, you know, they're, they're living you rather than you're living it. Um, so, you know, I, if psychoanalysis is a way of uh, freeing up some voices that allow them to speak in the hope of, you might say, engaging in a more um, creative and uh, communicative conversation, um, then it's that I take it to be a freedom enhancing movement of, of, of thought and activity. Um, and so I, I feel that the paradox that he, uh, you know, Zizek mentions, uh, you know, it's fun, you know, it sort of prompts thought, but I, I think it's not a, you know, sort of some big barrier or, or something that can't be addressed. Right. And what you have just said, I think points to the 
utility or purpose in the broader institution of psychoanalysis uh, that we'll get to again in a minute. But returning to the first part of your response, thank, thank you for clarifying how you're talking about the different different approaches of psychoanalysis and making clear that you're laying down a paradigm, but you are not being a dictator, if I can put it that way. And that's, yeah, that's my self-understanding. <laughs> you, can, you can tell me what you think. I'd like to follow through though, since we've, since we've broached this now, if I'm still right that you generally identify as following in the footsteps of Freud, if you were to pick out an immediate psychoanalytic ancestor rather than somebody like Lacan or, or Jung or but but I'll just say I'll just say Lacan thought him of himself as following Freud. I mean Lacan really you know at least Lacan's proclaimed self image is that he is a serious reader and follower of Freud. Um, and so I mean part of it is like <laughs> you know this is a question of is, you know a deep deep philosophical question that in, in certainly you know ra raised very prominently by by Kierkegaard, but also it goes back to. Plato, you could see it in the symposium. You know, what is it like to follow Socrates? Um, you know, the symposium, you have people putting on sandals and, you know, walking down paths that Socrates walked down, thinking, well, that's how I get to follow Socrates. Um, and, uh, you know, what would it be to be a true follower of Socrates? It's not, you know, it's, that's a deep, deep question. Now, with Freud, you know, if you ask me, am I a follower of Freud's? I mean, I think yes is a much better answer than no. Um, but, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, I disagree with him about lots of lots of things. Um, but I do see myself in a tradition that he, um, you know, he seems to me, a, you know, an extraordinarily important figure. And I do think that... Um, continued conversation with him is a very worthwhile activity. Two things that you've said are that uh, the fundamental rule opens up a different way of speaking your mind. And I guess the, I was going to say that psychoanalysis is a way of freeing up certain ways of, of speaking. So I guess that's actually the same thing. but. Adding to the irony of what Slavoj was saying, I think, is that one reason people end up in analysis is a lack of freedom in their unconscious. And I think this resonates with something else you've written about, which is that the unconscious can be experienced as fate or as engendering one's fate and free analysis then maybe, I mean, free association, the fundamental rule, is a way of uh, breaking up that experience of fate. Could you uh, elaborate on, on that? Yeah, sure. I mean, first, I would say I really agree with uh, Zizek on, on, you know, the, the, what you were saying about the, the unfreedom of the unconscious being a, a reason that, you know, people come into psychoanalysis. Um, <clears throat> I mean, the way, you know, in my experience, I think this is quite common. Again, people come for all sorts of reasons and there are lots of, you know, variation. But I think, again, a, a, an interesting paradigm of like, who comes to analysis and why, do, you know, why do they come? I mean, it's a it's scary. It's foreign. Um, you know, maybe some people are find it seductive and exciting. But most people uh, that I have experienced, you know, they have to overcome some hesitation in order to come. And like, why do they do it? And again, this is very anecdotal, but it rings true to me that, uh, you know, people come, you know, roughly speaking, uh, around the third breakup of a of a important relationship. Um, it's, you know, the first time they, you know, they fall in love with somebody and uh, and it didn't work out and they, um, you know, it's very upsetting um, and they're very absorbed in, in the pain, but, uh, you know, they move on and then they, uh, some time passes, they get into a second relationship and, uh, and then that one doesn't work out. And, um, 
you know, they don't quite see, you know, the last person, they, they, they don't quite see a pattern. Um, you know, the last person, last boyfriend or girlfriend or whatever it was seemed different than the second one and the breakup wasn't quite the same and this and that. But by the time the third relationship and the third breakup, um, people are pretty, get pretty panicked about themselves because there's a, you know, roughly speaking, I think, uh, this question starts to set in. I, I, I you know, I, again, I'm not a, uh, I, I'm not a sociologist. I haven't done any studies. This is all very anecdotal. But by, by people in their mid twenties, when they've had some, you know, re repeated heartbreak, and more in their 30s and more in their 40s, they start to get a little panicky about like, is this it for me and intimacy? Is that, you know, between me and being alive and being dead, is it just going to be these breakups? And um, so in a funny way, you know, it doesn't have to be a breakup. It could be some other repetitive problem. Um, you know, I always have try. You know, I've I found myself having trouble finishing my term papers, or I can't get my dissertation done. If we're moving into graduate su student territory, or you know, at, at work, I seem to always antagonize the boss, and I don't know why. And you know, <laughs> but you know, the the, the 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 person coming into analysis themselves has a feeling of. I mean, it might be quite low level on a low burner, dull, dull panic about, you know, roughly speaking, is this all there is to my life until I die? And so, you know, I think that many analytic patients themselves have, it may not be, it may be quite inchoate, but they do have a sense of some kind of repetition in their life that is, is, is making them very unhappy. And that, I think, is exactly the point about the unfree unconscious, uh, because what's happening, in my view, is, you know, I call in one of in some of my work, I've called it an imaginative a priori. But basically, the the imagination of this person is set up in quite fixed ways, such that they enter experience with a prior setup of how it's going to work out or how it's going to be interpreted. Um, I'm sure this is confirmed in all sorts of empirical studies in, in different ways, but as it shows up in the clinical situation, which is the one I'm familiar with, um, it's a, um, it is experienced as, I mean, there's a worry about a kind of fadedness um, to life's experience that may not be put, you know, exactly explicitly that, you know, in that formulation, but that is sort of the shape that they themselves are experiencing life and they're worried about it. That's what gets them in. Uh, you know, it's a feeling, well, maybe somebody could help me and I could use some help. So the, just to put this into my own words, the reason anecdotally, cause you've had, you've had a lot of experience that most people come into analysis is because they're in a rut whatever they've been going through, it just seems to keep on happening. And they're wondering how they're going to break out of this rut. And your interpretation of this is that the reason that they are in this rut, or maybe psychoanalysts interpret so psychoanalysis's interpretation of this is that they're in this rut because their unconscious has been formed in a certain way that leads them to act in certain ways and keep living out this pattern. And then consequently, the goal or purpose of free association is to get to the unconscious, to see what's going on there, bring it up to the level of awareness, and then hopefully change, change it somehow so that they're not enacting out these patterns over and over again. Yeah. I mean, basically, I agree with what you just said, Robinson. I just, the word I really want to emphasize in what you said is somehow. <laughs> you said, you know, change it somehow. And I'm really interested in what that somehow means. Um, I don't think, I mean, I, I, well, how to put it? I, I was just, I think I was going to say more than I, what I was about to say was too strong, but I am skeptical um, of just the mere, 
uh, ability to, to get conscious insight into what's going on with you, that that itself, um, I mean, I think that has real limits on how therapeutic it can be, what real limits on what a difference it can make. I mean, very neurotic, stuck people can have a lot of insight into what's going on with them, and it doesn't help them get out. So I think that there's, and I think this is a really, really important um, issue that I think psychoanalytic technique has to be understood or has to be something that has a kind of real efficacy in that the um, the uh, achievement of this understanding is itself um, efficacious in changing the very thing it understands. And, you know, I've made a rough analogy. I mean, I think it's rough and it needs, you know, it would need real refining, but to a philosophical audience, I think that the analogy is helpful between, you know, the understanding of what theoretical reason is and the understanding of what practical reason is. And theoretical understanding um, is, you know, fascinating and wonderful about how the world is, including myself, how I am in the world. Um, but what we want is something more like practical understanding, that the understanding is itself the efficacy of what it understands, um, that it, that the mind can really, via its own understanding, be efficacious in changing what it understands, namely my own mind. <laughs> and so I think psychoanalysis, when it's working well, and in, you know, these are paradigmatic moments, Psychoanalysis is that kind of efficacious engagement with the mind, whereby I can literally, I mean, I don't know if literally is the right word, but I, I really want to insist on the efficacy. I have, I acquire the capacity, the exercise of which is the changing of my mind. And here, I don't mean the simple, um, you know, change, I mean, you know, the simple, cha relatively straightforward change of mind where I change my beliefs. You know, I used to believe this about myself and now I've done some therapy and now I believe these other things about myself. No, I mean, what's really aimed at is changing the manner in which the mind functions. Um, uh, psychoanalysts talk about structural change uh, of the mind. I don't love that because it sounds a little too... Um, static for me, but it is changing the manner in which I mentally function via, you know, a kind of something along the lines of a practical understanding of how my own mind works. So <clears throat> free association, just to recapitulate a, a, lit, a bit and then follow through. So free association or the fundamental rule is one of the key tools for bringing out the unconscious. But then what are the aspects of psychoanalytic technique or practice that take the analyzand from having a mere understanding, as you put it, of their patterns to an efficacious understanding that changes the mind itself? Well, again, the, the, the topic we haven't yet named that is crucial to the story, as I understand it, is transference. Okay. And, you know, transference, dealing with the transference, trying to grasp what it is and intervene with it um, is, I think, another, like, absolutely characteristic hallmark of psychoanalysis. And I think it you know, again, speaking very, very broadly, but I think it's a um, a marker of like of how psychoanalysis differs from other forms of talking cure, like supportive psychotherapy. Um, and the transference is, uh, you know, we can talk about it as we go along, but roughly speaking, the transference and you know, there's so-called counter-transference too. We could talk about that. But it is the, as it emerges in the psychoanalytic situation, 
It is the, you might say, the enlivening activity and presence of what I've called this imaginative a priori right inside the analytic situation. So the imaginative structures that we've, you know, we've been talking about um, that um, uh, come alive in the in the analytic situation between analyst and analysant, and um, it's in the working with that li living imaginative activity in the here and now that that real psychic change, you know, can 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 occur. I mean, I can say more about how that works, but that's the you know that's the large scale answer. Hmm. Yes, I would. I certainly want to get back to or, and keep talking about transference, but there are still some more elements just about free about the fundamental rule in the unconscious that I'd like to talk about first. And you wrote in one of your papers that it establishes a special arena for reason and imagination to meet and interact. And you've already indicated this in our conversation, but that is what are you saying that this is what's happening in the mind of the analyzand or this arena for reason and imagination interacting? Maybe this gets back to transfer. Is this happening between the analyzand and analyst? Both. Okay. You know, both, uh, you know, both and some, you know, sometimes neither, but hopefully, you know, when things are working well, both. I mean, you know, sp the, the, you know, the analyst is there um, in part. I mean, there's a lot of reasons why the analyst is there, but in part is listening um, very hard as well as the analyst and. But the analyst and is himself or herself listening to what they themselves are saying. And. It's very, it's hard to describe um, how important this is because it seems so, um, uh, I don't know, it's easy to overlook, I suppose. But when you're lying on a couch and you're sort of staring at the ceiling or looking out, you know, looking out the window and all you're being asked to do is um, say what's on your mind, uh, firstly, it's a very physical, you're, you're much more uh, aware of the physicality, I think, of your speaking than normal, you know, day to day conversation where your mind is on like what you're listening to the other person and what are they saying and what do I think and what should I say back? What shouldn't I say? All the rest of it. When you're just lying on a couch, um, you know, the fact is speaking, um, you know, takes breath, breathing. I mean, you have to breathe into your lungs and breathe out as you speak. And hearing isn't just coming in through the ears. I mean, it's reverberating through um, your the bones of your head. And, uh, um, and suddenly you're, you know, what you're really doing now is listening to your own words um, in a way that, you know, um, uh, normal conversation, you, it just tends to overlook that. So there's just an enormous amount of, um, at least potentially, there's an enormous amount of potential attention to what you yourself are saying. And of course, you know, if you are, insofar as you're getting to the fundamental, you know, getting to in the direction of just saying what's ever on your mind, you're just hearing a lot of things. That, on the one hand, you feel your own agency, you yourself are saying them, you yourself are feeling yourself saying them. But, you know, it's kind of surprising that these are the things you're saying. So you, you, you can be very attentive to that. Or, you know, what is, again, as I said at the beginning, often people really find it too difficult to follow the fundamental rule. Um, they don't really want to say what comes into their mind, but then their mind gets full up of, you know, well, I'm not saying it. And, um, uh, you know, what should I do? <laughs> and, uh, uh, and, and, but then they're, they're aware of their conflict. I mean, or at least they're in a position where they could be more aware of the conflict if they're not really saying what they're thinking. Now, the analyst is, you know, in the game, you know, very much, and they're in the game together. I don't mean to, you know, be talking. I mean, I have to, I'm trying to talk about two aspects of what I think of as a unified situation. But the analyst is listening hard, too, for what is and what isn't being said. And I do think, you know, psychoanalysis 
as a is a master craft. It's a techne. It's a, you know, it's something an analyst can get better at over a lifetime because you're listening <clears throat> to how you're listening to how another person constructs their speech and you're listening to their pauses when they shift away, when sentences get broken up. These are all, um, you know, very, very important things to be to be listening for. But hopefully what you're doing is listening together. Before I get right back to this more substantive thread, I want to ask about the lying on the couch that you just spoke about. And lying on the couch is obviously one of the most culturally visible uh, features of <clears throat> psychoanalysis. And my understanding is that it is something that is not always done by psychoanalysts. People are, some people are shifting away from that. And in psychodynamic psychotherapy, which is uh, on one end of a psychoan psychoanalytic continuum, it's not really practiced at all. Is this somewhere that you're more comfortable being dogmatic and you think no. maybe it's wrong. Okay. <laughs> no, no, no. I let a thousand flowers bloom. I really believe that. And I think, you know, sit up, uh, move around, uh, you know, have more than one person. I mean, there are all sorts of things that one might do. I mean, for me, the crucial issues are, are people being encouraged to speak their minds in the manner of the fundamental rule? And is that being attended to or not? That seems a very big deal to me. That if you give that up, um, it's it's a problem. I you know I just I don't I'd like to know more about what what you are doing and why you think that is psychoanalysis. So I think you know for me the fundamental rules is quite important in 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 um, and uh, that and it's that around which you can play in quite a lot of ways. And um, ditto. The second thing I think is really very important is dealing with the transference, recognizing it, understanding it, addressing it, that's crucial for, from, in my point of view of, about what makes analysis special. Uh, lying on the couch, I mean, I, you know, I, 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 have, I, 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 I can say some things in favor of it. There's some, th there are some things to be said in favor of it. But if somebody says to me, look, they've got good reasons for doing it some other way, or this patient, it's better with, with them not, not to, that makes complete sense to me. Okay. Yeah, the reason that I asked was, was was just that you you gave a very convincing list of reasons why lying down is significant to the practice. Well, I think it's great. I mean, I do think it's great in the sense that when it's working well, I think it frees the person up in many, many ways because, you know, they enter a, a kind of intermediate state between waking and dreaming uh they don't you know if somebody like you and i we you know we're recording this conversation but we can see each other's faces we we read each other's faces we can't help it that's what we do as human beings and so if we're sitting up and looking at each other we can have a great conversation and it can be quite insightful and for some people it might work much better but and so i'm not trying to argue against the sitting up or, you know, at all. I'm really not. But, you know, it's sort of like two cheers for the couch, which is not three cheers, but two cheers for the couch in this, you know, that when it works well for somebody, it's great for them not to be making eye contact, to be thinking about, you know, they could, they in a funny way, if they're worried about what I'm thinking about them, that's a wonderful place to explore. I mean, what are they worried about? What do they think I'm thinking? Um, in a funny way, it frees them up more to figure out what are they worried about, what's their imagination about, if they're not looking at my face. Uh, my face is fairly easy to read, I think. Uh, so, um, but, you know, for other people, it may just be if somebody say, you know, if a, if a, if a person I was working with said, you know, I'd much rather sit up, um, and do this. I mean, I'd want to know why. I'd like to explore that, what that means for them. But I wouldn't be opposed to it. Um, or... Well, my understanding is that another change in psychoanalysis, uh, granted that it's not just one thing and this is 
reductive and being simplistic is that analysts used to barely speak at all and sometimes wouldn't speak at all in a session, but this is something that has changed. And you said that one of the major roles of the analyst is listening, and that's pretty pretty obvious. Uh, and that they're they're listening to how sentences are formed, how they're broken up. But I've heard that analysts train to listen in various different ways that you don't listen to people speak in day-to-day conversations. Like sometimes sometimes an analyst will enter something like a reverie-like state. And I'm wondering what's ideally going on in the analyst's mind as they listen to their analyst and what are some of these different types of listening? How are they taking in the free association of their analyst and, and making it a productive experience for both of them? Well, I'll just say, firstly, there's a lot of debate about this. It's, uh, you know, p- people, and there are a lot of, you know, different views about the questions you're asking me. I will say, I think it's a cultural phenomenon. I mean, it, it, it you know, it's a contingent piece of history um, that when psychoanalysis came to America, it was medicalized. Uh, you know, it was brought into the profession of medical doctors. And, you know, in most of the 20th century, um, you know, for instance, you know, in the days when I became a, a psychoanalyst, I mean, I had to go through enormous procedures to get, you know, so-called waiver uh, to be able to train as an analyst because the rule back then was that you had to be a, a medical doctor to train. Now, that all loosened up in the last, you know, let's say 30 years of the 20th century, but even then it was a slow and contested process. Now, I think that contingent piece of history. I mean, Freud thought that, you know, as he, there's an essay called The Question of Lay Analysis. He did not think you ought to be or had to be a medical doctor. He was, he was one and many people were, but um, he didn't think that was necessary. Um, and there's a lot to be said on, uh, you know, on, on why it's a good idea or, you know, what was a bad idea about it. I mean, I'm not saying one thing, but that I think contributed to a certain reception of psychoanalytic technique um, that I think was, um, uh, uh, well, needed correction. Uh, And so I think one of the, you know, sort of idealizing images of the medical reception of psychoanalysis was the image of the surgeon who just sort of goes in and makes an intervention in the mind. And, you know, we do the surgery, we get out the pathogen, and um, and that led to a kind of um, so- socialization of psychoanalysts that I think was too rigid and somewhat, and it could fit a, a, a you know um, a cold personality. Um, and there were medical doctors who were trained psychoanalysts who I think were, um, you know, uh, too stiff. And to uh, and so I think the issue about how much you speak or how little you speak um, got caught up in a contingent history of a social history that um, that under underwent correction over time. Uh, I don't think you know I my but my story isn't I don't mean it to be a progressivist story that we're all you know we're just on the route to getting better and better at doing this I don't believe that either um, so. You know, the question you ask, it's a very difficult one. I mean, I do think it's sort of uh, part of, uh, you know, very um, complex issues of technique. But the overall thought, I think, is, uh, you know, I don't, I mean, this is, I want to be facilitating a process where we, the analyst and and I are working together, but the point is not for the analyst and to learn my theories about who she or he is. Um, And in some important sense, I've got nothing to tell them. Um, It's to help them 
with their own efforts to be able to speak their mind and say who they are in ways that um, uh, um, facilitate the process of, you might say, becoming themselves in a creative, flourishing, and, you know, roughly speaking, truthful way. Now, the question, you know, how much do you say or when do you say it uh, or how little, you know, it's it, it, the, the, it, that's not easy to answer just by, well, should we talk a lot or should we talk a little? It's got to be answered, you know, you might say via the teleological structure that I've been outlining. You've got to look, what are we trying to promote and how do we how do we get there? And so insofar as I'm busy telling people what I think they think, um, I feel I'm getting in the way of their own process um, of being able to say to themselves and to us um, who they are, what's important and how they want to flourish. Um, so, you know, it's not about for me, it's not an issue of how much, but um, um, what is it to facilitate this kind of a therapeutic process? And then digging into the second part of my question, how is it that you're listening to the analyst and to help facilitate and determine what you're going to determine what you're going to say that will then facilitate the therapeutic process? Well, well, thanks. I, a couple of things. Firstly, you know, I myself was in analysis for a very long, I mean, you know, by, by normal human counting standards by a very long time. Is it an appropriate I mean, it question to ask how long? Well, I'm, you know, <laughs> you're allowed to ask anything you want. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, it depends on how you count um, about how long it was because I, um, I did a, my, I was in, I was teaching at Yale for 10 years. And I was in analysis that entire decade. Um, and then I went to the University of Chicago. I, you know, I graduated from, um, from the Institute and I took a job uh, at Chicago and moved to Chicago. Um, uh, and that was, so that the answer to that number is 10. But, um, I came back to Yale, uh, once a week because I was raising my daughter in New Haven. So I, you know, I was spending half the week in New Haven and half the week in, um, in uh, Chicago, a little bit, you know, that sort of thing. And I kept, you know, I, I, I continue to just go see my analyst uh, once a week at that point. And for me, it was just sort of, I don't know, it was, I, you know, by then I felt I had gotten the hang of analysis and I was doing, you know, a lot more of the analytic work than I was at the beginning. But I kept going for another, I think, you know, until my daughter went to college, I stopped going to New Haven. So that would be another eight years, I suppose, something like that. So it's not bad, you know, in terms of like my, you know, the, the, the odometer. I mean, I was, <laughs> um, but it was great. I mean, it was a wonderful experience for me, a huge help to me. And, um, uh, but I, you know, to answer your question, I feel, you know, I feel I got a good, the analysis itself was a wonderful training in like getting attuned to when things just get thrown up in your own mind, in your own imagination. And it, it, it helps me, you know, to stay somewhat, I think, sort of in tune. I, I, I can, you know, firstly, tr thoughts get triggered in me, but also, and I'm, and I think I'm more aware of that because of my own analytic work. Uh, I mean, my own analysis, but I'm also, you know, I, I feel, I got a, it's not aside from my analysis, I got a really good training at the Western New England Institute. And, um, you know, so what I'm listening for are themes um, that keep coming up, associations, um, where is this going? I, a million, th a, mil a million things. Do they look? Do they look tired? Have they had coffee this morning? Is there a song in their mind? I mean, I, I sort of feel. I mean, I think this is part of Freud's thought that everything is you know, tremendously connected to a lot of other things. So it sort of almost doesn't matter which thing it is. But if you, you know, well, I'll say one more thing about technique, which is if the goal is to help the analyzant become more acquainted with how, who they are, how their mind works, you know, how, 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 how things are for them, 
then it's crucially important that one stays very close to what to what they are aware of themselves. Uh, because it's no good. I mean, you know, Freud's, the early theories of Freud, which are mostly what's in the popular imagination, is that the psychoanalyst is some kind of, you know, gold digger or, you know, just can, you know, or, you know, knows what's locked in the bottom closet and, you know, just can, or, you know, sort of like uh, Sherlock Holmes could just announce who did the murder or, you know, this sort of thing. I mean, what good is that if, 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 if it's just the expert's knowledge and it's not really close to what the analysts and themselves um, are aware of. So a lot of what I'm listening for and trying to, you know, be alive to is what is alive right now for the analysts and what's really close or present in their own consciousness such that you can go there and they will be able to take it further, not you. Um, I mean, I don't know whether you've ever had the experience, but, I, you know, I have had the experience like you can feel a, a thought leaving you, <laughs> you know, that there's, you know, sometimes, you know, there's something you wanted to say and it, it goes out of your mind. But there's sometimes, you know what you want to say and it goes out of your mind, but you can feel it leaving. I mean, there's a phenomenology to it. Um, that's very close to, I mean, people can feel if they pay attention, a thought escaping. <laughs> and, um, and if you, if you've got your ears open, you know, I mean, that's what I'm listening for. I'm sort of, I don't know if, you know, I, I'm very attuned to, you know, is there a moment where not only is the analyzand moving away from a thought, but that she or he can feel themselves moving away from it. Um, then if you can, you know, sort of, you know, name it in the moment, they've got it themselves. It's not some abstract thought. It's an experience they're having that's alive and um, it's theirs. And then the question is, you know, well, where can they go with that? This isn't so it's not sort of, you know, abstract following out of a theory. It's trying to live with the patient or the analyst and through her thoughts or his thoughts in ways that they can take it a step or two or three steps further. I imagine that this sort of analytic listening that you've been describing where you become very attuned to another, what another person is feeling and attending to also helps you outside of analysis and connecting with people because it takes a lot of effort to stay focused on someone in that way. And that effort has to be trained. I don't think it really comes naturally to many people when we've got our own monkey minds running around. I like, you know, I like listening to people <laughs> and, um, you know, I, you know, I mean, I didn't, I haven't met you before. I didn't know where this conversation would go. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I find humans just wonderful and fascinating. I mean, they're not altogether terrific, I have to say, but, uh, but you know, some of the time, some of, and some of them are, uh, but fascinating and complex. And uh, so I, I like, uh, I like that about, you know, that's where I feel that about Socrates. And in a funny way, I felt that about Aristotle. I feel there is something, you know, it depends on, you know, what do you mean by the philosophical impulse? Um, but for me, Socrates is philosophical impulse. I mean, part of it was like to take things where they show up. I mean, he would meet, he would encounter people in the Agora, you know, roughly speaking on the street. And he would meet them sort of where they were. Um, you know, Euthyphro is a, for me a, a paradigm of going off. He's just on his way to sue his father in court. Um, but, you know, it was a kind of... Um, faith, I think, that if you stuck with it, this moment, this encountered moment, philosophy would open up. And now, you know, Aristotle wasn't as, you know, concerned with like that individual conversation in the moment, but I think he did have that impulse that about life in general, that um, I think about being in general, but uh, actually, but for me, more concentrated in the phenomena of life, that if you let a living thing 
if you if you allow yourself to encounter a living thing, a universe will open up in which philosophizing becomes appropriate. And I like that impulse. I like that impulse a lot. And uh, yeah, and so I think of psychoanalysis as sort of in that world. It differs in certain important ways, but it has that um, commitment to you know, trying to provide circumstances in which a person will, if it, will open up and uh, in parts that they, you wouldn't otherwise see. Hmm. I, I'd like if it's, if it's okay with you to go back to this time at Yale and Yale and Chicago, just for a few minutes, because I think for our listeners who aren't, familiar with psychoanalysis and this might be one of their first times listening to a discussion about it they might have just heard that you were in analysis for 18 years and they're they're confused and first if it's okay if we keep talking about this when you were in yale at yale were you going the traditional like four or five times a week and then for the second eight years it was just once a week is that yeah yeah okay yeah yeah. So, uh, you know, firstly, I just want to say once you get into the swing of it, I think analysis is part of a way of life. I mean, I don't think my, you know, whether I was going to see this guy or not, I mean, after a certain way of getting the hang of it, you know, I sort of feel I've been in analysis the rest of my life. Only I, you know, I took on the analytic role, um, you know, so I don't think of it as I mean, I think of it as um when it's, I mean, from my point, of, I mean, there are analyses that can't end. I think that's a, not a good thing. I think analysis, you need need to say goodbye um, to your uh, to to your to your analyst, um, and and they need to be finite and over. I mean, I just felt, you know, I I felt I was done after, you know, when I was ready to when I went to Chicago, I was done. But I was going back, and I thought I'd just check in, um, and it was nice. I could have not done it. I did it. It doesn't, you know, for me. But once I stopped, you know, I had to say goodbye to him. Uh, and, he, you know, he died. And that's those are things that happen. Um, but I think that, you know, once you get into the um, swing of it, that analytic thinking becomes part of life. It's not just some sort of fixed thing that is just over. You never do it again. Uh, that's what I think. So um, I didn't. That, that's exactly what I wanted to ask. And you, I want to dig into it just a little bit more. But so analysis is part of a way of life. I understand that. And that the analysis doesn't end once you start thinking this way. You You do it for the rest of your life. But how is it determined then when the relationship with the, the analyst ends and you're ready to go off on your own. Is that something that can be said in a few sentences or does it totally vary widely? Yeah, I mean, r roughly speaking, I think it's um, when you're done. <laughs> I mean, that's the shortest answer. But, um, you know, I think just going back to what we were talking about, firstly, I'll just say in my analytic experience, in my clinical experience, working with other people, my experience has been about four years, five years of working with people, and then it seems time to, to stop. Um, and I, we, I feel we've, you know, have we, have we addressed the central issues that were keeping them from flourishing? The, the ways that we were talking at the beginning of our conversation about being stuck and very unhappy making, um, rituals uh, and fates, have we done enough so that they can open out to life and go on on their own? Um, my view is that it's in my experience, you know, which is limited, but my personal clinical experience is about four years was five years is seems like, yes, is that's about right. Now, um, and could I have done that in four years or five? I think yes is the answer. Um, Part of the, you know, part of the reason I stayed on was I, f I found it very valuable. And analysis, as you know, is like a, um, you know, it's an important part of my life. And I just wanted to keep going and see where it led. Uh, but I didn't feel in any, I mean, you know, I, there was no pressure. I mean, I think the, um, the time that it's appropriate to end is when um, can you 
move on in a more open way with life that you used to be able to do. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you for this. And I'd like to get back now to the more theoretical threads of our discussion. And very early on, you mentioned this idea of Lagos. And you also mentioned likening the fundamental rule to the Sabbath. And as I understood it, on the one hand, Lagos is thinking with reason. It's sort of, it's premeditated. It's what we're doing six days of the week when we're speaking. And then the Sabbath, uh, free association, the fundamental rule, we're not premeditating, premeditating what we're going to say or filtering it in any ways. And the antithesis, I think, of reason is self-contradiction. And I understand that self-contradiction, and maybe more specifically, the recognition of self-contradiction is very important for analysis. And I'm wondering how this, if I'm right, how this emerges in the course of free association and how the recognition of anti-logos or of self-contradiction is ultimately therapeutic. Well, I think I want to frame things a bit differently, slightly differently than you framed it. I mean, it, what you s said, I think it seems almost right, but not importantly, not right, too. Um, so firstly, you know, what is reason? Uh, you know, I mean, I don't think we can assume we know already what it is such that we can then say, well, this other stuff clearly isn't. Um, and so that that's part of what I, uh, I mean, let, sorry, let me just say, um, let, with the Sabbath analogy, here's one thing I think is very important. I mean, on the one hand, the Sabbath is very different from every other day of the week with respect to being commanded to rest. On the other hand, you don't get the unity of a week without the Sabbath. I mean, you know, it's sort of without Sabbath, the Sabbath day is a crucial part of what it is that makes the week a week. So there's a, uh, you know, there's a, you know, on the one hand, the Sabbath is very different. On the other hand, it's essential part of creating um, a kind, certain kind of integration of a life. Now, um, you know, the way I want to think about reason is that in Logos is that um, certain uh, hallmarks have been laid down from the beginning of philosophy about what Logos and reason is. And, you know, part of it, and, and there, but there are, there are a family of them. I mean, one of them is, as you were saying, and I was saying earlier, this capacity for uh, reason debate, I mean, for asking questions and asking for answers. I mean, if, if, you know, we can ask another person, well, why do you think that rather than something else? And the other person is supposed to be able to give reasons about like why I think this. And, you know, that all of the, all of that, when that's working well, uh, is the activity of reason. And then related to that, it's, 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 it's in the same family is this, um, ability to, uh, uh, distinguish appearance from reality, that we have a capacity that's often related to what we were just talking about, arguing with each other, or asking each other questions, and, you know, answers for we are capable of developing a capacity to say, well, I know this is how things appear, but how are they really? And we have to think about, you know, how are they really? Um, uh, via this exercise of, of reasoning capacity. The third hallmark for me is I get from Socrates, who at the Republic said that um, part of the job of the part of the soul that he called reason was its job was, as he put it, to rule over the rest of the soul. Um, that basically the integration of the whole psyche into a unified and harmonious whole was reason's responsibility and proper activity. 
So I want to say, well, these are three very important hallmarks of reason. And we're going to find out what reason is over time, historical time and philosophical time, by figuring out what activities and capacities of the soul can do these very things that reason needs to be able to do. Now, one of the things that you, you know, discover, I think, two things that you discover when you do psychoanalytic work are one, uh, you know, for a troubled, let's say, neurotic person, a person that Freud called neurotic, they have a very hard time distinguishing appearance from reality. I mean, that would be the that's what the transference is. That's what the imaginative a priori is. That's why people, you know, repeatedly find themselves in the same situation. Well, um, you know, they take themselves to be experiencing life as it really is or experiencing some other person as they really are, but they're trapped by appearances. And so what is going to be the activity by which they develop a capacity to distinguish appearance from reality? My view is that it's a psychoanalytic process. So that the psychoanalytic process itself should be um, understood as partially constitutive of the activity of reason. I mean, I know that's an unusual view, but um, I'm getting there. These are, this is how I get there. And, um, you, you know, similarly, if what we are, if, if Socrates was right, that, you know, part of reason's task is to really integrate the psyche in a, in, in a way that's appropriate for reason's activity to be, um, you know, properly bringing the whole psyche into a unified harmony, you know, then I think, again, psychoanalytic activity is the activity of reason. So I don't think, just as I think, you know, which is more of the week, uh, the Sabbath or the non-Sabbath days? No, non-Sabbath days are very different from the Sabbath, but they're equally part of the week. Um, and they're very importantly constitutive of, of the unity of a week. I want to say that it's true. Um, on the one hand, you know, it, I mean, there, you know, there's, I don't know if, what the right word is. It's complexity or, you know, in, enjoyable paradox. But part of the activity of reason is allowing the um, mind to just express itself, but under, under the care of a certain kind of loving attention to what this is and what it all means. So I want to say all of it's the activity of reason. I mean, but different in different sort of, aspects hmm. you said that the the neurotic can't distinguish appearance from reality and i'm wondering if you could just give me like a toy example to help make sense of this because i'm not totally sure that i understand what it means to say that well what i was uh, alluding to were these repetitive patterns where um but the way it shows up would be uh um a propensity to feel that you're 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 getting insulted that some or that people or people are you know don't esteem you uh, that you're somebody who people don't respect. Let's say that you know that you 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 experience people as uh, not paying attention to you, or not respecting you enough, or not valuing you enough, or not loving you enough, or insulting you or whatever. That these um, <clears throat> these can be. Um, I mean, we're familiar with, uh, uh, you know, we, it's very familiar to say, uh, you know, he or she has a quick temper. <laughs> well, you know, what is it to have a quick temper? Well, it's to be very disposed to feeling somebody else is insulting you and then to have a routine of responding with a certain kind of a flare up. Uh, now, some of those, you know, people, I want to say neurotics can be very good at picking up all the occasions where they rightly deserve to be angry, uh, but they're also very good at inventing certain situations or making them, you know, making it seem as though this is really what's happening, um, that I'm really being overlooked or she doesn't really appreciate me, he doesn't really appreciate me, doesn't, you know, um, 
that's appearance. <laughs> and the, the, this is the key. I mean, this is the, you know, can I, do I have the capacity to distinguish cases where I am genuinely not esteemed when I ought to be, have more, you know, better, be better treated from occasions where I, 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 I'm, I'm actually quite imaginative in creating that. And um, this is what, you know, many people don't have. So developing the capacity to work out in a kind of rigorous way, which what is what is reality here? What is psychic reality? And what's the difference between it being a false appearance and not? Um, this is, I think, the activity of reason. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. I, I'm also very glad that you corrected me and explained the relationship between that you see between Lagos reason and the Sabbath. There are just a couple more things I want to talk about regarding free association before we dig into transference. Uh, but the first thing I asked a couple of minutes ago, but how you see self contradiction and the recognition of self contradiction functioning in the fundamental rule and why that is therapeutic. Well, you know, the way I understand what Freud was talking about, I mean, he, he said the unconscious, you know, it doesn't, doesn't pay it. The way it really, what he was really saying is the unconscious doesn't pay attention to contradiction. Um, and I think that he's getting at something really important and right. But I think it's been misunderstood, especially, you know, when I was growing up, you know, my, my training is in analytic philosophy. And, um, you know, Donald Davidson was one of my teachers. Uh, and, um, <clears throat> and, you know, he had an article about, um, you know, irrational belief and the unconscious. And, you know, for him to, you know, he treated the contradiction as though in one part of the mind, you believe P, but in another part of the mind, you didn't believe P. And that's why you had to have a sort of two minds theory of the mind because of, you know, the holism of the mind, you had to have a lot of other things that fit together with P and somewhere else in another part of the mind, you had to have a lot of things that fit together with not P and thus you, you know, there's a reason for, I don't think that's what Freud was talking about. Um, and, but what Freud was talking about is, like, in, again, back to, uh, uh, you know, just an you know, ordinary example. If I am somebody who is, let's say, disposed to think that people um, don't esteem me, then on those occasions when um, I get, let's say, a, a, a real compliment, uh, either I just won't notice it. Uh, I don't really sort of register it as, you know, hey, wait a second, I think people don't esteem me, but this guy is just giving me a compliment, so it can't be true that people don't esteem me. Um, one way to go is for me to think, um, uh, just not to notice it, to think about other things, to notice other things. Um, that's, or to um, go into stories like he couldn't really mean it, he was just trying to flatter me, he wants something, or he's just being polite, or, you know, all sorts of explanatory stories. Um, but that's the point that when, um, you know, the unconscious is set up, when we have a very strong imaginative a priori, like, um, well, or I'm, I'm not worth it, you know, I, I'm not worth somebody's love, then all the contradictory evidence um, it doesn't register with us, you know, so I think Freud's point is not that we both think we are esteemed and we think we're not esteemed at the same time in the same way, only one's unconscious. I don't think that's, you know, that's just not what he was thinking about, or it's not the way it shows up. I mean, what shows up is a kind of, um, uh, there's a kind of feisty durability to these structures of, you know, you know, there's a kind of commitment that isn't really recognized as the commitment it is um, for life to be unhappy in different ways. And like, it seems so strange, like, why should people want to be unhappy? And uh, of course, in certain ways, they don't want to be unhappy. That's partly why they've come to get some help. But that strategies get selected um, 
that are not happy making, but they do serve some kind of function. You know, if I, this is something I've, you know, written about, but if I am sure ahead of time that you're going to disappoint me in some way or other, then in a funny way, I've protected myself from you ever disappointing me because I sort of got there first <laughs> and uh, I've taken care of it. I know the way it is. I've got security. Uh, I get something out of it that in a funny way, you can't hurt me because I've already hurt myself, um, protecting myself against you hurting me. Now, that isn't a happy making way to live, but it makes a certain kind of strategic sense. And when I've found that to be a sort of, you know, sturdy and robust way of living, however unhappy making it might be, I have also developed techniques of not noticing or not paying proper attention to the countervailing evidence or experience. I, I like that phrase you just used, uh, feisty durability. But the last thing that I wanted to ask about here was dreams. And we've spoken about how one of the main points of the fundamental rule is to make the unconscious conscious and perhaps to, to make these feisty, durable patterns conscious. And I'm wondering why dreams tend to come out in the context of the fundamental rule and perhaps just to, to throw something out using this neurotic person who is worried about being insulted as an example. If this is something that they're constantly worried about, it might be something that they're constantly dreaming about being insulted. And if it comes out when they're free associating, this might be useful for the analyst and analyzand because if this happens often, it might alert you to alert the two of you to the possibility that this person is conflating appearance with reality because the, the, the pervasion of insults in a dream, for instance, might suggest that uh, this is an appearance and it's not reality. I don't know if that was clear enough. Yeah. Um, I mean, place I would like to start is by saying, you know, for as long as we have recorded human history, we have records of humans having dreams and taking them as significant in some way or other. I mean, people, you know, would go to seers and wise men and, um, or, you know, uh, kings would have dreams and it goes, you know, it's, it's, it's in the Bible. I mean, Joseph is an interpreter of, you know, of dreams. And um, so it's part, it, I, you know, I really want to make sure that, you know, we look at dreams and the reception of the, you know, how human beings have experienced dreams as a wide ranging phenomenon across time and cultures um, and not, you know, the specific domain of psychoanalysis. What, ha you know, two things are true. Uh, one is people dream and they seem to remember their dreams. And um, if there's something about the remembered dream that strikes people as enigmatic, uh, pressing on them, making them motivated to go to somebody else to help them understand what it means, um, there's dreams just present themselves to humans as um, not just as remembered content, but as puzzling and somewhat pressing. Um, now, it turned out, you know, I mean, Freud discovered it, you know, I, not by accident, but, you know, it turns out that um, people will remember, you know, if you ask them to say whatever comes to their mind, they will come back with um you know, dreams often will come out. But by now, it's hard to say much about that because, you know, it's so much part of the cultural reception of psychoanalysis that, you know, people report their dreams and they, um, and Freud, you know, thought his, in the, you know, his favorite book, 
I think was the interpretation of dreams. But I worry about this in talking about it with you because um, what I think psychoanalysis needs to get away from, which was in the model, Freud really tried, I mean, at least in, in, in you know the official theory, he himself tried to get away from it. But I, it's got to be, uh, insofar as dreams are of any use at all, it can't be on the model of I've had the dream and your job is to tell me what it means. Uh, that goes back to the, I think, the bad model of psychoanalysis of the expert telling the non-expert what's going on with them. I, you know, so, uh, uh, you know, I, that's a, that's very worrisome. On the other hand, people do have dreams and they're great. <laughs> so, I mean, from my point of view, the issue is, um, if somebody comes in with a dream, I'm interested in letting them go on free associating. What does that make you think of? What comes next to mind? Where are we, where are we going to go from here? But no, it's not my job to, uh, you know, be the expert to interpret the dream. Now, but what you do see, and, and just in terms of like the kind of example you see, um, one of my, uh, you know, in Lausanne's, I talk about it in one of my essays, had a dream of being stopped in front of a red light while other people were going straight through the red light and they weren't getting caught. Um, and then this person at some point made a slip of the two slips of the tongue where she got confused about whether, you know, she meant red light, but she said green light. Uh, and then one time she meant green light, she said red light. So you don't have to, say, you know, I think I've said enough that let your own imagination wander. But the dream wasn't, you know, the dream was condensed down into this one very concrete image of red lights and green lights and being stopped at a red light and other people going through the red light. And, you know, if you let yourself, you know, you might say dream about it or just imagine around it, you can see this can be symbolic for a whole way of living. Uh, somehow the world presents itself as like, I'm the guy who has to stop at red lights. Everybody else gets to get away with things. They don't get caught. Or, you know, at one point I, I, I find myself, I'm stopped at green lights. What's that about? Um, so you can see that, you know, um, an image that can come up in a dream that, you know, it's not really clear just from the immediate reporting of the image. But as soon as you start to think about it, you can think, you know, a universe of meaning, of really organized meaning about how life is organized can be condensed in these um, very rich images. It sounds to me that this dream that you've just described does have a canonical, meaningful interpretation, or at least you see it that way. So it's what you were saying a few minutes ago that while this may be the case, you just don't see it as your job to tell this to the analyst. And it is there, it's your purpose to listen and perhaps facilitate their own coming to understand what their dreams might mean. I agree with that. I mean, the other thing I really think that, I, you know, that I haven't mentioned, but part of why I think it's important that, um, um, you know, for, I mean, there are a lot of reasons why I think frequent meetings are good, but, you know, you might say, you, you know, roughly speaking, this isn't, it's not football. It's more like baseball. It's not like there are eight games in the season. There are, you know, it's like 70 games in the season. You know, there's, um, I, I don't think, I don't feel any pressure to get to the truth about anything at any particular moment. You know, I mean, I, I feel the pressure to remain truthful, but if there's a real issue here, it will come up again and there will be a different, there'll be another dream. It'll be about something else. Um, so I don't feel under any pressure to get to the bottom of anything um, on any particular occasion. It ought to be, I mean, if, if I, if what I'm saying is correct, that there are these kind of fundamental structures, they're going to be displayed again and again and again and again. And exactly what they are, you know, you might, you know, you might learn a lot over a fair amount of time. Um, so, you know, I'm trying to present very thumbnail sketches so you can get the sort of basic idea. 
But, um, uh, you know, so I don't feel that uh, we needed to understand that particular dream. This one came up, you know, it had a kind of clarity and richness that made it worth focusing on. Hmm. Yeah. But many don't. Hmm. I hadn't heard this explanation of the utility of frequent meetings before, but it's quite compelling to me just because I know how often forcing something is counterproductive in any number of different endeavors. So uh, having frequent meetings, yeah, takes the pressure off. But now for the, the last time that, or the rest of the time we have together, I'd like to turn back to transference, which is what sounds like uh, where the magic happens in psychoanalysis. And for our listeners, again, for whom this may be their first encounter with psychoanalysis, I know that you mentioned it earlier, but I'm hoping that as with the fundamental rule, you might be able to tell us how Freud conceived of transference and its role in the therapy. Well, um, you know, I mean, Freud conceptualized it uh, in different ways over over a number of years. But, um, you know, I, in Freud, uh, uh, I, I think to, to his credit, he really started to think about how it worked in response to a terrible failure of his, um, the analysis of a patient he called Dora, which really did um, break down and he's got a lot of, you know, uh, responsibility for, uh, for that happening. <clears throat> but, you know, he wrote a postscript to the, the case and it was his analysis of what went wrong. Um, I mean, there's, you know, a tremendous amount to be said about it, but basically he said that he felt he got caught in a, um, a transference with it. He himself didn't recognize that it was a, um, that he, was being treated as though he were some other figure um, and that somehow there was some, you know, an imaginative life going on in the room where some he was being seen in some way that he himself didn't grasp. Uh, you know, there's a lot to be said about his failure, and I think the failure uh, con continued on in his uh, in his uh, appendix. But um, but the idea was uh, that not only are these are there these imaginative a priori structures, but it's inevitable that we will be caught up in them. And for that reason, they're extremely difficult to see, and they can be very difficult emotionally to experience. And I think a lot of psychoanalytic training is the training of trying to recognize, you might say, when you're in the midst of... Um, you know, transference and countertransference. This is going on in you know uh, in both both people. Um, trying to recognize when you're in it, while you're in it, in the moment, so that you can address it in the moment. Um, now, this is, I think, very um, different from supportive forms of psychotherapy, which I you know, and again, I don't mean to. Um, Things can be very psychoanalytic and meet once a week and be called psychotherapy or whatever. The issue is, you know, are is are are we, as it were, trying to pay attention to these unconscious structures that we find ourselves inevitably in the midst of them, and they're very very hard to, uh, they can be very hard to recognize, um, but that that's very important because this is the living psychic reality that's going on uh, and can you can you name it rather than just live it out I mean something I've seen I'll just to give you an example which I think will will help a lot I mean I've seen patients I mean people who come to me have often had um, some kind of non-analytic but supportive psychotherapeutic um, relations before that they found quite helpful but the transference wasn't addressed. And here's the idea. I mean, I, um, I mean, I'll just give a kind of paradigm, which is, uh, you know, a, a person comes in uh, and they're very, uh, what they come in with as a problem is they've been dating this other person 
for a long time and are they going to break up with them or are they going to get married? It's just that time. You know, it's should I marry this person? But if I don't marry them, I better break. We better break up because we've been, you know, it's just the time of life. I've got to make this life decision. And, uh, uh, you know, long discussions about how she feels about it, how she feels about him. Uh, should she do it? It does seem like a, you know, they, the, the, the therapist and the patient have a good working relationship. At the end of a year, she decides that really it's time to take the next step, the life step, um, and um, uh, uh, get make the mature thing to do is to get married. And um, the person, you know, they say goodbye to each other. It's, you know, seen to be a successful therapy. The person gets married and, um, and things then don't work out well. And then I see them years later at the end of an unhappy or in the midst of an unhappy marriage. And what emerges is in that earlier therapeutic encounter, what was, you know, the topic of the encounter was all about the relationship with the, you know, the boyfriend um, and should they get married and, and about her maturity. And what was left out was what's the relationship between the therapist and the patient? And, you know, so for instance, was the patient looking to the therapist to be the mother she never had or to be the father she never had and to give her sort of advice about how to grow up or what next stage to make? And did she interpret the therapist without anybody saying so? It's basically communicating the message, you know, if you're mature, you know, if this if this uh, therapy is working well, you'll get mature and the mature thing to do is get married. And um, and off she goes with a fantasy of pleasing her father or mother for fi and also delighted that she finally got the advice she never got before. All of that is ignored. The entire therapy is con concentrated on, you know, their the relationship with the boyfriend or the girlfriend and about maturity and this and that. So that, for me, that's, a, you know, it's a very tangible example of if you're not paying attention to, hey, what's going on in this room? What's going on in the transference? Who am I for you now? Um, the therapy can miss out on, you know, crucially life changing, you know, experiences and decisions. So transference quite roughly is when the analyzand treats the analyst as someone they are not, and then counter transference would be the other way around. Ditto. And you know, it can be a it can be a dualist I mean it can be, you know, there don't have to be two things. It can be one that, you know, you either concentrate, what are we doing together that we don't know about? Um and how do we get conscious of that in ways that are effective? So, so when, and, I, yeah. when I was having trouble understanding the relationship between reality and appearance for the neurotic, your example of the neurotic with uh, perceiving insults was very helpful. And your example of the analyzand who was dreaming about red and green lights, that was very helpful. I think it would be really helpful to flesh out the therapeutic role of transference to hear another example of how acknowledging and addressing transference in the course of an analysis proved therapeutic and helped the analyzand go from merely having an understanding of their mind to developing this ability to efficaciously alter their mind and thinking. Yeah. Well, sure. Uh, let me just continue on with the example I use because I think it's a good one. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, you know, let, let me, I'm going to, you know, so, okay. Uh, so, the th instead, you know, what, what would the transformation that I was talking about, you know, in a, in a therapy that doesn't deal with the transference, the issue was, and this is, you know, this is a real life case. I'm trying to keep it so um, 
sketchy that it doesn't give any details out, but um, it's more like, you know, looking at an x-ray or something. But, um, you know, the issue was framed as, and it was a very pressing issue. The issue was framed as, should I marry this guy? I've been going out with him fi for five years. I'm in, you know, I'm, 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 I'm approaching 30. I've either got to break up with him or, um, or not. And if I don't, then we have to marry. Should I do that or not? And then the year was spent, just the pros and the cons, and it's time to grow up, and it's time to this and that. Um, but it was never, the question was never asked, you know, uh, in some important sense, well, how could I help you with this? I mean, or at least it was the assumption that the we already knew how the um, – the, the therapist would help in the sense that he'd be a sympathetic listener, like a good friend, only a professional, somebody with, you know, who had some experience in this. But what got completely ignored was this tremendous wish of this approaching 30 year old that the therapist would be a kind of benign parent or a parent-like figure, or a parent substitute. That, this is, again, Freud's distinction, that was acted out rather than analyzed. In a funny way, the therapist in, was acted like a, the benign uncle, or the benign friend, or the, you know, the supportive presence who, you know, who understands things, who have seen other people get married. But what was completely ignored was like, there's a drama we're both acting out here, um, both the therapist and the, which is, you know, dad or mom, you know, or I didn't have a dad or mom that paid enough attention and really helped me figure out how to grow up and become an adult myself. And now you're doing it for me. And I'm so grateful. And, you know, I don't know all the details of this, but my sense is the therapist liked being admired and being, you know, he liked the um you know the gratitude and um and so what wasn't looked at was and which would be looked at in you know in any therapy that takes the transference seriously it's like um what am i here for you as and why is that so important um you know what do you think do you think you know you need my approval to get married? Or do you think I'll disapprove of you if you decide you just don't want to marry this person? I mean, do you think I'm here to pressure you one way or the other about your marriage decision? I mean, what do you think I'm thinking here? Um, and who am I, you know, who are you for me? I mean, am I, um, you know, so in a funny way, I think about this case that I'm telling you, the central issue of their um, of that therapy never really got mentioned. Uh, you know, it was all taken to be about something outside the room, about whether I should marry this guy or not. But in fact, you know, there was a longing for a parent to say, you know, the next step, if you really want to grow up, uh, you know, there's this wish that some parent would say, you know, if you really want to grow up, you don't know what it is to grow up, but I do. And, the, you know, the way you grow up is... You get married and I love you. I'm your parent. I love you. And I know a lot. And, um, you know, you you do what I tell you and um, and you're going to be happy. And uh, uh, not that that therapist thought that, but I think that was the transference that um, the, the 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 patient felt um, that just a tremendous longing for to please the parent by following the advice, but the advice was never there. I mean, I don't know what went on, you know, in terms of the therapist's mind. I just, but, you know, it might not have been there. It might've been there. Who knows? But, you know, there was a year long therapy where what I think of as a central issue in that case, which was, you know, in what way was the patient trying to please her therapist? In, by getting married to show that the therapy worked. She did grow up and this was what growing up means. Um, none of that was mentioned and it had a lifelong effect. I mean, this person entered a marriage that didn't, you know, 
for the wrong reasons. And um, so that's, an, for me, this is a very concrete example of like, if you don't pay attention to the transference, you've got to, you know, th there can be devastating things you don't see. And to give a sort of hypothetical completion to this story, in the story, recognizing the transference would have been helpful because this woman might have in recognizing that she was looking for a parent figure, realize that the decision was for her to make and that she could have made this decision without having to go over the pros and cons indecisively for a year and thus improved her self-esteem somehow? Well, that, I, I mean, I think that's, you know, yes, uh, I think there's more to be said, but, yes. you know, yes is a better answer than no. But the end, but the fact is, you know, she, it, you know, in a funny way, what she didn't understand and what I, you know, it did, it seemed to me the therapist ig ignored was that in a funny way, it was never about making up her mind. You know, the entire therapy was cast as though that's the issue. She needs to make up her mind, yes or no, which should it be? No. I mean, what was happening, I think, was, you know, I, you know, and, and hearing, I only heard one side of this, but what struck me as what was happening is that that question, you know, she thought the, the issue was she had to make up her mind and the question was yes or no. And uh, she made she and she came at the end of therapy, and the question was yes. My view, and listen, you know, listening to her, was that that was never the question, ever in the entire year. The question was always, "Daddy, which, you know, would you tell me the grown-up thing to do, and will you make up your mind? Is this a good person?" And should I do it? And in a funny way, without her knowing it, she was trying to get into an arranged marriage. You know, she wanted her therapist to decide. And she experienced her therapist. I mean, God only knows what the therapist did. He might have, that's part of why I think the transference is so important. I, you know, who knows what the therapist was thinking? I'm not saying, but, um, but what he wasn't doing, this I know, was paying attention to the transference or bringing it into the therapy. Because what seems, you know, the, the the real question that was alive in the room is, um, you know, daddy or mommy or whatever, you know, is this the secret to growing up? Should I marry this guy? And she experienced her therapist as saying, yes, this is the way to grow up. Um, now, that's the issue that the therapy, you know, should have been about. Like, uh but it never entered the room as a question. It was pervasive in the room. It was what dominated the room for a year, but it never got addressed. And so that's what, you know, that's, I think, a, it's a, you know, it's a little vignette and there's so much more to be said, but it gives, it gives a sense for me about like why the transference is so important. Uh, because the very, what's the, you know, the very question at issue remained in the dark. Um, and again, you know, appearance and reality, the appearance of that therapy was that it was her decision about whether to do it or not. She went through a maturing process and she, as a, a growing, mature person, decided, yes, she will get married. But that entire structure, from my point of view, um, obscured the crucial issue, which was she wanted a parent figure, a loving parent figure to teach her how to grow up and to tell her what to do as the secret to growing up. And she did it. She made the decision, you know, consciously thinking she this was the mature decision, completely unaware of the unconscious dimensions of the desire for a kind of magical parental figure who will give her the secret of the meaning of life and growing up. Basically, in sum, what this story tells me is that the transference can reveal something very deep about someone, though this can manifest quite differently depending on cases. That that sounds like it something sums things up for me. Yeah, well, I think that's, I mean, that's good. I think so too. But also just to add this one thing is like, 
how do you notice it? It's the thing is that you're, you know, the thing that it's so hard. This is what needs training is that, you know, the, the therapist and the patient were in the middle of a drama with each other. And because they're in the middle of it, it's hard to see it. They thought that they, th they thought of themselves as in a different setup than the one they were, they were importantly in. There's a conscious dimension of expertise and this and that, but the transference was everywhere present and yet nowhere noticed. And so it take, it's hard to notice it. It's hard to notice it because you're in the middle of it. And I think that's partly that is a very important part of psychoanalysis, psychoanalytic training is to try and learn how to notice what's going on in the midst of a situation where it's not easy to do. Hmm. Well, Jonathan, the last thing that I'd like to talk about today is, well, w w this has not been an advertisement for psychoanalysis. We've been talking about some theoretical and, and practical issues. But at the beginning of our conversation, we spoke a bit about your anecdotal experience of who goes to psychoanalysis. But what I'm wondering in finishing is who you see psychoanalysis as for and are there ways it can be there are ways it can be accessible for people who are interested well that's a really great question i yeah that's right I, again i mean obviously i think this is a very helpful and important form of therapy for some people i certainly feel there are a lot of different ways people can help other people uh, via talking to them. And um, I want to make no claims um, for, uh, uh, you know, which is the best or whatever. I think different people have different needs. Uh, but, you know, roughly speaking, I mean, you know, I'm talking, am I right in thinking you're a graduate student? Yeah. I mean, roughly speaking, the kind of person who goes to graduate school, you know, quite often, not always, tends to be somebody who would, would be helpful for. Um, you know, it's, uh, you know, f those for whom reflecting on their lives with some degree of articulateness, for whom that kind of matters, uh, this can be a huge help. And um, for those for whom it matters, I think it can be quite um, dramatically helpful in freeing them up and freeing up their imaginations. I mean, I think that's, you know, part of the uh, activity of analysis is the freeing up of imagination uh, so that it can move in different places to, from the sort of, as you, you use the word rut, the ruts um, that, that people are in. Um, so that, that's, I think, you know, um, uh, that, that, that those, those are people who, um, for whom I think it can be a great benefit. Now, how is it accessible? I think that's a really um, important um, problem. Uh, you know, I solved it myself in a personal way that I, do, I basically don't charge. I mean, I charge very low fees. I, I see people who can't afford it, but I'm in a very lucky position um, because I, you know, I'm a professor and I get to teach and I don't need to earn more money than my salary. So I've always looked for um, people who, you know, people, you know, young and creative stage of their lives, um, but you know, no, no funds. I mean, most analytic an institutes, they'll have a clinic and you get in, people will, um, um, you know, the low fee analyses are possible. I mean, it helps to be living in a city where there are psychoanalytic institutes. Um, and there are other, I mean, people who are trained, you know, there are people who are trained as analysts who support themselves via once a week psychotherapy, they can charge, you know, people can afford more to pay more for a single hour. If you start having to pay for that 
several times a week. It's, you know, you can't afford as much. So there are people I, you know, many people I know who there are analysts, people who have trained as analysts love analysis and they want to do analysis. Um, but, you know, they can't make a whole career of analysis because there aren't enough patients to afford it. I think that in a funny way, that's a good thing because I think we need to be, the profession needs to offer um, analysis to people who can't afford full fees. So um, a lot of analysts will offer, you know, subsidize um, analytic work because they themselves want to do it. They will charge a lower fee in order to be able to do analytic work um, as well as their psychotherapeutic work. Um, but I mean, I think you've put your finger on a, um, I mean, I feel we're ending our discussion on a, a very important note. I think there's something that's very problematic about the psychoanalytic situation vis-a-vis -vis money. And, um, you know, on the one hand, uh, uh, you know, analysts need to be able to earn their living. I mean, they need to be paid for what they do. On the other hand, if they do see people repeatedly, you know, which I think you do need to do in an analytic situation. You can't earn, you know, it's, it's much harder because you have so, so much fewer people who need to support your life. So the question is, you know, how do we, how do we solve this problem, both individually and socially? Um, I think it's a, it's a very important problem. I do think there are ways to address it, but, um, I don't think the solutions are easy and I do think they're very important. I think analysis ought to be available to a wide range of people who, for whom it would be a good form. I mean, I think many people could, could benefit from different forms of treatment, but um, it ought not to be built into the structure that it's expensive. Well, Jonathan, this has been a serious treat. I've been looking forward to this conversation for a long time. I think about a year now since I uh, first reached out to you to talk. So thank you so much for having this conversation with me. Well, Robinson, it's been very nice to meet you. And, uh, you know, I hope the conversation is, uh, has helped in terms of explaining this, but it's been a, it's been a real pleasure to talk with you. Hold on. If you haven't subscribed, liked, commented, or reviewed, that would be so helpful. And if you haven't yet, you could also follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Robinson Airhome.